put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. 300 Rise of an Empire 3D Mood Review. With the Oracle's prediction ringing in their ears, the Athenians, you know, the boy-loving philosophers that we heard about, are also quite anxious about this whole idea of Persia invading, enslaving, and in, in piercing, presumably, all of Greece. And Themistocles, the general of Athens, a general of Athens, is determined not to let Xerxes in with, without a decided fight. It doesn't seem like the other, you know, he, he goes to Sparta in order to get some assistance, but Gerard Butler didn't really want to reprise his role, so, well, he's just conveniently off-screen. It happens to be the, the time where he's at the E4s and the Oracle, that, that's when Themistocles arrives, and he leaves without a, a clear indication that, that Sparta will help. They are kind of standing on their own. So he sets out to fight off the, the, the mighty Persian fleet with his small, minuscule really, compared to the Persian one, Greek fleet, which does have some things in its favor. It's faster and more maneuverable, and it does have Themistocles at its helm. And the man does have some nice tactics. But will that be enough? Because on the other side, Xerxes has the general Artemisia, a, a Greek woman who, in response to having been betrayed by Greeks herself, kind of, yeah, turned on Greece and became determined to destroy and subjugate Greece. And there will be a, a, a face-off between these two brilliant strategists. And I suppose that pretty well covers the plot. Now, this one is a little bit of a mess as far as the whole chronological... I mean, it doesn't jump that much in the overall chronological order. But, or I mean, it doesn't jump back and forth too much. But it does skip between different events. It, it mostly moves forward, but it takes several huge steps. It's very much like someone was just flipping through their, their history book of, of ancient Greece and they were like, oh, this sounds interesting and this other thing sounds interesting. Oh, a lot of stuff happens in between. It, is it really that important? We'll just, you know, so literally the movie, the, the first thing we see is, or rather, the, the earliest, the chronologically earliest thing we see in this movie is the Battle of Marathon. And 
it's it's really a there, there's that legend of I'm I'm not sure it's quite true, but there's the legend that in actuality, once the the you know once the battle was settled, an Athenian messenger ran from Marathon back to Athens, I guess, and that was the, the you know, 42 point something kilometers, and he just arrived and orally related to the boy-loving, as I said, you know, he, he gave the message and then he collapsed dead from the exhaustion. Why that was not put in the film, I do not know, because that, that right there is, is you know, that's, that's a good image to have. But anyway, yes, we, we start at the Battle of Marathon, and certainly something, if, yeah, it's, it's not really a, a spoiler. Themistocles kills Xerxes' father, the, the then king of, of Persia, Darius. And that, that's during the first invasion by Persia of Greece. Then we skip ahead to when, yeah, to, to when basically the time of the first movie, of 300. And then a lot of the movie is happening as 300 is happening, and then once 300 is over, this film is still going. And it's It has some trouble with this kind of... There's... there... With the first one, you have some very clear goals. You have some very clear, hopeful, you know... I mean, what... What might the, the events of 300 lead to? What might the... The, the last stand of these 300 Spartans in the face of thousands of Persians, what might that accomplish? It will say to the rest of the world, and to all of Greece specifically, that although the, the Persian force is a vast one, it does not mean that they can just, you know, just wade right through. You know, some people will still stand, and sometimes numbers don't make the, you know, the, the huge difference, and don't really ultimately decide the, the, the outcome of a battle. And it, it's very much going, you know, the, the you, you have the Persians who very much, it's about Xerxes wants you to be on your, he wants you on your knees, and then he'll give you whatever you want. Where King Leonidas of the Spartans makes no such promises. There is no, might go good, might go bad, but if we fight, then that will matter. It is, it is not easy, and it is not you know, it's not exactly a long career necessarily, but yeah, so so you have these kind of, you know, it will matter if we make our last stand here, and you know, even even if we aren't talking about the the kind of values and you know, it'll it'll also tell our allies they'll tell the rest of the rest of Greece that we can beat this guy we can beat the Persian forces and this one it kind of goes into well okay Greece will be united and it's you know with with the broader kind of Focus, I suppose you could put, it, 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 say, I, you know, it, it's hinting at, okay, if, if things go as they should here, Persia will be defeated. And one thing is just like, historically, I mean, 
for those who don't want the movie spoiled, I'm not going to give away what, what historically happened. And no, it's not because I don't actually know historically. Okay, it is also, but in addition to that, you do have that it's just this sort of... Part of it is that you might you might say that Greece being united isn't that almost kind of what would happen at least united in their you know in making a stand against Xerxes that's that's what 300 is also about and you know the defeat of the Persians that is also you know that's in part what I mean the last stand of the 300 means that eventually we will defeat them. We Greeks will defeat the Persians and there we have this you know it's 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 implied and really it's not I'm not the first reviewer to to bring up did this movie really need to exist and essentially Ultimately, the answer is no. I very much enjoyed this film, however, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's fun to watch. I would recommend it, especially in theaters. It's very much a movie to go to the theater for. But it is very much, it's a sequel to a movie that did not need a sequel and didn't really call for a sequel at all. There really wasn't that much left to say. I mean, like I said, a lot of this movie is what happens in another part of Greece while the 300 fight. And obviously, if you want the full historical kind of overview, yes, th things are not decided, you know, purely by what happens at this one point, especially with something like war, where thousands upon thousands of people and, you know, units are involved. Of course, it's not just this one place, but does knowing what happened in the rest of it necessarily make a, you know, did we need to see it, and does it really change anything? If you don't watch this movie, you're not really going to be missing much that, that 300 didn't give you. Now, if we go the, the other direction, if you go into this not having watched 300, there are some things that it doesn't... it doesn't set up everything but at the same time, it's, it's kind of half and half. It, in part, says, in case you didn't watch the first one, I mean, there's this bit where, th when Themistocles goes to Sparta, we have this sequence that very nicely sort of, you know, introduces us to Sparta. I mean, basically, they're, they're beating the crap out of this one guy. You know, they're, they're yeah just decimating him, and that's, you know, and yeah, you have some interactions that very clearly define, you know, Themistocles is an Athenian, and these other guys are Spartans, and it, there's, there's the, the, this thing of, you know, you, we again have this kind of worship of the Spartans that we saw in, in 300, it's actually quite ironic, and I don't think it was intentional. I think the first thing Lena Headey says, uh, you know, Queen, Queen Gorgo says to Themistocles when he arrives in Sparta is, did you come this far to stroke your penis to the sight of real warriors? And really, I don't think that the writers realize that that's essentially what the film is doing at this point. Because really, I mean, if they're expecting people who have watched 
300 anyway, then they really might as well just, you know, skip this entire, you know, intro to it, which, I mean, I'm glad they had it there. It was a fun sequence, but, yeah, and, and at the same time, it doesn't really tell you everything that would really need to... Yeah, it's just... It... It doesn't entirely stand on its own, but it's at its best when it does stand on its own. To get into some of the, the real strengths here, this is not an adaptation of a comic book. Frank Miller started working on one as this movie was being produced, but they kind of, as far as I understand, they, you know, the, the comic and the film, independently of, of each other, you know, took shape over time, so they're different stories. There, there are going to be some differences, no matter how much the, as far as I understand, the Frank Miller, the, the comic is not entirely done yet anyway, and none of it has been completely finalized. But, yeah, so, no matter what, it's going to be somewhat of a different, you know, thing. It's not panel-for-panel panel adaptation like the first one was. And the first one did suffer some from having to fit everything in these panels. Constantly trying to reach this kind of... Zack Snyder expressed that he found it fun to fill in what happened between the panels. And I'm, I don't doubt that it was a fun experiment, but it doesn't make for a, as compelling a film when really it is working entirely within the confines of these panels. Film and comic, they're, they're very different mediums, and what works in one is not necessarily going to work in the other. I would say Sin City is the only example of comic, straight comic to film adaptation that really works. And in part this is because Sin City isn't really an epic. It's essentially a noir. It's, you know, each Sin City graphic novel is a noir story, a small fraction of the overall sort of, you know, tapestry of, of what has happened, what is going on in Sin City. And as such, it, it works within the, the, these very sort of, I mean, as a film, the, this whole adherence to the panels can feel very constricting and claustrophobic. And when you are telling a noir story, I mean, basically, you know, your lead is being hunted or hiding or something, and he is just, you know, navigating the, the tight, narrow alleys of Sin City trying to get to something. So it works. The, the fact that there, there is this limitation works in its favor, really. And it maybe also helps that Robert Rodriguez has, you know, he, he can do both. He can, he can draw and, and sort of work within the, the comic book field. I'm, I'm not certain how much he's actually done within straight comic book field, but he does seem to understand the medium and he, you know, he does films, or he, he did films, you know, he's not so much anymore, but yes, that's, that's not for, for this particular video. And yeah, this, this gains a lot from not facing those restrictions of, of trying to live up to panels. This feels a lot more like a conventional action film. I... If, if you go into this not knowing there's a comic book, you won't necessarily be able to tell. I mean, it it is stylized, but plenty of action these days is, and 
there, yeah, just, it, it is freer. There, there are a few of these shots, these, you know, extended shots where the camera doesn't cut, it just moves in order to show more going on. And, th and these shots never last as long here as they did in the first. So where, so, so yeah, it, it makes it more intense, it makes it very, yeah, just, it, it gives it that sort of, yeah, it, it frees up those boundaries that we felt in the first one, and this, yeah, feel, feels more like a regular, action film and it, you don't really, yeah, I think that was about it, and, and another, a big difference, and you'll be able to tell this right from the start, is this is much grittier than the first. The first is very heavily stylized, this one is very gritty, and that's not to say that it's entirely realistic, it's still, it's preposterously violent and, you know, gratuitous. But you can really sense and feel every, every beat of sweat, every drop of blood, and the sort of in 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 the first one, very rarely is there really I mean, there's blood, but it's usually in this very sort of almost beautiful as awful as that sounds, kind of, you know, it's it has a beautiful quality to it, the way it, in slow motion, sprays out, you know, and that's about it. it I noted in my review of the first one, it, blood is never on the ground, and that this was a conscious decision. And I think there's maybe like one or two scenes where someone is like kind of dirty you know here it's 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 down at frequent you know and that's again of course i mean action movies today are made to be gritty but it does also really add to it it makes you it makes the threat more substantial and where the first one very much felt like we were witnessing a, a moving painting of sorts. Uh, you know, a lot of what we were looking at was a painting. It was it was a art artistic recreation of uh, an an idealization of something. This still has the the whole idealized view of especially Sparta, but also some other of Greece. But. It's, it feels closer to reality, and certainly we can practically feel it, you know, right by ourselves. And this is mainly because of, of the gritty. It's sadly not so much because of the 3D. I don't, I'm not sure if this was post-conversion, but I could imagine so. I mean, there are times where it's used well. I mean, the obvious thing to do with this is to have the blood spray out onto the audience. And they do do this at times, and there are a few other things like debris, not, not big, but just some debris might come at us, and this kind of thing, but it does feel very much like an afterthought. It's not even the kind of, well, we don't want to be too obvious about it. It's not even, you know, I mean, if they had just gone for like the, you know, or just, if they had gone for something like Avatar, where it enhances the atmosphere, where you feel like there there is a real depth there, and a, you know, you can almost reach out and touch some of the plant life, there's not really anything like that here. It's, yeah, if, if you know, you, you might as well watch this in 2D basically, but like I said earlier, definitely do watch it on the, on the big screen, because it does have a scope that really deserves the big screen. 
now. It is still very much of this kind of macho male power fantasy and yeah, it's it's still very much these guys are kicking ass when when they really need to and just I mean just because they don't have long shots of of this happening, there is still a lot of just Greeks killing Persians without too much resistance and, and the like. And it remains exciting, excuse me, and, and really fun to watch. Very well choreographed. And this adds, in fact I say mostly this is, sea battles. And this was a, I mean, this, this makes a couple of decisions in kind of, it, it does the sequel thing of trying to outdo its predecessor by being bigger. And where 300 was pretty much this one location, at battle size, one location, battle wise, one location and sort of one type of combat, you know, ground, land combat. This is very much, you know, this, this is a greater area that it overall takes place. It's mostly on, on the sea, so, you know, where the first one was land, this one is sea, and there is a... I don't really want to give too much away, but there are a number of different ways that the combat takes shape because it is on, on the open, open, on, it, it is on sea and there is a lot of opportunity there. You, you can't really, you know, yeah, it's, it's not quite the same as with, with the 300 at Thermobile. Now, the you can very much tell that this wasn't Zack Snyder, and that's kind of for better or for worse. I mean, both of his adaptations that were panel by panel have suffered some from that limitation. At least with 300, it was a story that made sense to put up on the big screen where Watchmen essentially is a drama where several of the main characters happen to be, you know, costumed vigilantes. And it's not really that much of a of an action story. And it's certainly yeah, it there there are various aspects and while both movies look great, they do also suffer from being such close adaptations. But at the same time, we have seen that Snyder can do rather well when he isn't hampered by a, you know, panel by panel, you know, adaptation. So, yeah, his, his more experienced hand is also missed here. This was directed by Noam Murrow, who, as far as I understand, this is like the second thing he's directed. And while I haven't seen the first, from what I can tell, it seems like it was kind of average at best. And certainly this one doesn't really... I mean... This could have been directed by any no-name kind of thing, you know. It, it, he doesn't display any distinct style here. It feels like 300 light, almost. It's, it's very much trying to look like the first one. And part of it is that while there's definitely a lot of slow motion again, and, you know, it, it does do the slow motion and fast motion thing, some of the slow motion here is not that good. There, there are things that are, you know, put into slow motion that 
that didn't really need to be and that don't really particularly look better because they're in, in slow motion. And the cinematography, it's it's good, but it's not it's not Snyder. It's not at all the you know the level of the first one. Now the it is again all green screened and this was especially apparently all the all the scenes at sea they were filmed without water and that gave a lot of freedom for you know yeah for for how to to do it and that does really work out i mean you can't really tell from from looking at it that it's not real water and definitely it does you know the part of what makes these work is that basically everything is a is a tool in the hands of the storytellers is something they can mold and shape to tell the story how they want and when even the water around and underneath the ships become that it it only aids it further and the the sea war the the yeah the the sea warfare in this is amazing and it's again very much that you know where where we have a lot of Hollywood action movies where it's you know, well, these were really badasses, you know, here is not, I, you know, it's not saying they won because they were badasses. It's saying they won because they used smart tactics and were badasses, because you can't win them all. But you really do see that they used very smart tactics, and as far as I understand, several of the things we see them do in this, they actually did in real life. And, yeah, it just, it makes a lot of sense, and... It's genuinely exciting and, and stimulating to see. We see a lot of action movies these days where they, the good guys live because they're the good guys and they're supposed to live, and the bad guys die because they're bad guys and they should die. And here it is very much, I mean, there are scenes where, you know, well, this group should lose lose now, so they'll lose now. But at the same time, we do have a lot of this more interesting battle where we very much see that just, yeah, using tactics really pays off. And there is a... Yeah, the, the, again, I, I mentioned earlier that the film goes bigger than the first, and that's another area. This has more different types of tactics than the first did, and they're all quite enjoyable to, to watch, and they are they're the kind of tactics where we can follow the, the thought process behind it without them having to, you know, hold our hand too much through it. Now, the... This is still very much a story where, you know, characters and plot are a, a bit forgettable, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're not really the main draw here. Now, with that, there are some notable differences. As I've already mentioned, the plot is a bit messy when compared to the first. There's just all these, all these sudden jumps in, you know, in the chronology. I mean, if the movie had removed the battle of Marathon at the beginning of the film and just rewritten it slightly, that would probably help. It, it really only serves to confuse because after the outcome there, we don't really see anything that leads to the, you know, the events that we already know some of with, 
you know, Xerxes leading an invading force of Greece to, towards Greece in, in, you know, in 480 BC. So it doesn't really add a lot. And I mean, it does. Yeah, it's not a, a spoiler to say that the murder of Darius is Xerxes' father is what motivates him to become the god king. He submerges in this, you know, pool of, of mysticism and, you know, alchemy and, and things like that and, and emerges, you know, clean-shaven. They actually do say this and he's now, you know, pierced and all this jewelry so I don't know, I, I just, I wonder how much they charge, because I have been considering to get some work done, and I'm just, it looks like it's a lot faster and less painful than that, and I, I appreciate that, well, nothing was left of the man that, you know, that he was, before. Well, you know, if, if, if it might save some money, I, I, I may actually have to consider it. So... It has a part in the overall plot, but this could easily have been rewritten. So it's, uh, yeah, it 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 does suffer under this. You know, there there were a lot of different things that they really wanted to put in. Now the yes, so so as far as characters go, we do have some differences. We the, Where the first one has this sort of buddy, friendly rivalry kind of thing with Stelios and Astinos, this has a father-son dynamic with Callista and Silius or something like that. And yeah, it's, it's this thing of very openly, like, the father doesn't really want the son to fight, but the son is determined to prove that he, or, you know, it's it's kind of, he feels overprotected. And if you sing the Britney song at me, I will slap you. Uh, man, that reference is old. Anyway, yes, so, so the... Basically, we have this thing of, you know, the man wants to, the, the son wants to prove he's a man now, dog, and, yeah, that's, a, that's about it. So, so, we explore that dynamic in some, and Themistocles is a different, he's not, he's not Leonidas. He is sort of more of this, he's, he's certainly arrogant. And there is some, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a different man. There is a, the way he and Leonidas responds to, respond to, you know, the, the idea that they might lead young men to, into death. They, they have very different views on that, and I'm not really going to give away what they are here. And he certainly does do some speeches, but nothing really measures up to Leonidas' speeches. And it's again, that it doesn't really help that the first one was so much about stroking the ego of the Spartans, and this one kind of has to follow along with that, and the Athenians aren't as big as the Spartans are as important, and this whole thing, not as, not as great warriors, and so it, you know, the film intentionally knows, you know, he can't be as big as Leonidas, and yeah, obviously that's gonna cost it some, and Xerxes is back, although he doesn't really do or say all that much that's like really interesting. I mean, it's nothing like his 
Roland the First, where I mean just just the scene between him and Leonidas. That alone is worth, you know, at least getting into the film just to enjoy that 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 whole exchange there and in this he just doesn't really do or say all that much that's you know I mean I I was happy to find out that I mean we see him before he becomes God King Xerxes so he's he's still got the, the beard he's looking very Paolo like lost Snakey and Paolo and I was really relieved to find that he could still act in this. So it's it's not a reverse Samson kind of thing with the, the acting talent being you know being being tied to the, the hair or the beard. But yeah, he doesn't really do or say anything. If I sees his back and he doesn't really he's not completely useless, but the fact that he's back isn't really a huge deal, really. I mean, I read that he would have a substantial role in this. Not really, but I, I will say that that's another part where you can really see the difference between the two movies. I mean, I really like the way that he looked, the, the disfigured kind of with the hump and the whole thing in the first, but here it's just devastating. It looks so real. You can practically reach out and touch it. You can imagine what it feels like. And it is just, yeah, they're, they're, you know, this is no longer a painting. This is just, this is a high definition video camera. It is completely, you know, you're, you're seeing what it's really like. With, with this, and it's it's really, you know, horrifying looking. So, that's, that's very nicely done. Now, with the, the characters, I have saved the best for last, because Eva Green's Artemisia is awesome. It's, other reviewers have, have said, you know, she pretty much steals the show, and she really does. There's just... Ava Green just disappears into this brutal, blood, bloodlusting kind of just she devil. You just completely. She she is just a monster of a. Excuse me. I'm I'm not. I don't mean that in that you can't at all sympathize with her, but the thing she does, she is very much just, yeah, you do not want to, you know, you do not want to get on her bad side. Plain and simple, there's this, yeah, yeah, she's just fantastic. Like, one of the first things we see her do, and this is, this is not a spoiler, this is shown very early on, we get her into our backstory which all I'm really gonna say is she was she was betrayed by Greeks and she she was then helped by Persians and so it's actually it's a slightly maybe more than slightly obvious attempt to sort of tie these films together and it's yeah, you'll, you'll know it when you see it, and it really is kind of a, did they really do that? Did they really feel the need to do that? They really, they really did not need to do that, you know? So, so, so yeah, she's betrayed, and so she wants to avenge. She, she wants revenge on Greece. And, yeah, the, the lengths she goes to, to attain it, are quite brutal, and she, as Themistocles, is a brilliant general at sea. And there is this kind of love-hate relationship going on between the two, because there is a, there is that kind of, 
a respect between warlords. It's, it's this kind of thing of they are... She is very much seeking a challenge. She, she's bored with leading the, the Persian Empire, this vast empire's army. Everyone just, you know, either gives up or is destroyed. That's no fun. Themistocles, however, he actually does start to pose a challenge to her, and that, you know, that gets her interest. And at the same time for him, it's kind of this, she represents the, the thing that he really has to f defend Greece against, because she is the tactician. Xerxes and his, you know, thousands, millions of forces, th that's a numbers game. That's, you know, it's, it's possible to defeat an overwhelming force with the right strategy, but an overwhelming force and a brilliant general, that is dangerous. So their, their dynamic is great. And I'm not going to give away, it's just, they have a scene together which is just, yeah, it's, it's a really great kind of, it, it explores that dynamic well. And, yeah, she's, there's, there's really no time where she doesn't make it enjoyable. Whenever she's involved, it's at least enjoyable. Now, this does have this, this does have a storyteller character again. This time it's Queen Gorgo, and it, there are several problems with this. Part of it is that so much of it really isn't narrated. The, the thing with the first one, and this is again, this is a comic book thing, there's a lot of narration, and that's just, that works well in comic book form, and it can also work well in, in movie form, and it works well in the first because it is the storyteller character who is present for all of it. And, you know, Delios are quite a lot of what goes on. And this is gone into well in the, yeah, in the first one, where here it's a bit less... Yeah, it's just... It feels like there's a storyteller because the first one had it, and this one really didn't need it. And yeah, the part of it is that, that so much of it really isn't narrated, and really didn't need to be. There, there are more dialogue scenes in this than in the first. And, and that's again, you know, Frank Miller, he likes to say things without dialogue. And that's, you know, that's part of the appeal of his work, is the, the unsaid, that, that which is not said out loud by the, the characters. And, yeah, is, you know, if this wasn't a sequel to a Frank Miller work, then there wouldn't have been a narrator in this. Yeah, no, another part of the thing is that Queen Gorgo is not present for that much of the story. I mean, she's in Sparta for, for most of this. And, you know, I mean, again, most of this takes place while 300 is still going on. So most of, for most of this film, she is just in Sparta waiting for Leonidas to come back. So why is she telling the story? It's, it's, yeah. Now, we have some great design work here. There are not that many creatures. There are still a few of, of these fantastical creatures. But 
more so it's this, you know, it's, it's the ships and the kind of, um, you know, some, some weaponry and, and this kind of thing. We, we do see some immortals though, and they are very, there's a nice sort of, there's some redesign. You can still very much tell that it's them, but they're not quite the same as they were. The, in part, it's again grittier, and it's also just, yeah, it, it looks awesome. Now, the, we again have, you know, our, our heroes very much, you know, just the cape and the speedos, where in real life, of course, they, they had armor and the like, and it's again following the, the Roman art concept of heroic nudity, where, you know, you show the, the beauty of the human body. Now... Maybe part of this also, of, of the whole narrator thing, again, as, you know, there are less creatures, so there are, there are less fantastical elements, although still the, the battles themselves are larger than life. Part of it here also is, why does it really need to be kind of made to be? larger than life and grand, where, where 300, the, the entire story is supposed to rile you up for, you know, because the whole point there is, they're not quite going to win, but now that you know how well they did, and you know that, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing where this doesn't really need a... I mean, if, if this entire film was basically just a more or less historical account and it didn't, it wasn't tremendously, you know, if it, if it wasn't as epic as it is, it wouldn't necessarily lose all that much where 300 itself would be a completely different story if it wasn't for all these elements that made it more of a just, you know, there, in 300 there's a reason why the E4s are these disgusting, inbred, horrible beings, you know, more, more swine than man, or whatever the line is, and, you know, it's, it's so that when they say, no, you can't bring the entire army, it's kind of, ugh, well, those disgusting things, of course they would... Where here, yeah, that just isn't really... Yeah. Now, the... This is... This doesn't really have, have these sort of moral lessons or, you know, immorals that the first one did, it's not really... <sighs> yeah, it's, it's not really trying to say something specific about certain values or the like. I mean, you... Again, it, it talks about a, a united Greece, it talks about freedom and democracy, but it doesn't fully feel like a kind of... It, it feels more like they're just using those words to give it more... You know, I mean, it doesn't feel like they're lying in order to make their fight seem fair. You, you know... I mean, we, we do side easily with the Greeks, but it doesn't really feel like they're fighting for as much as they say they're fighting for. It feels like they're just fighting to, you know, not be invaded, basically. And, and that's, of course, that's understandable, but that's a history lesson. That's not a rousing, action-epic story, you know. We, we want to know about the kind of thing that really changed things, or that, that set 
a new standard for things. And that again, that's where 300 was very much, we Spartans are warriors, these Persians are, they may be many, but they are slaves. Slaves working beneath a supposed god king who whose hubris betrays him. And here, I mean, we, we don't really know that much about the Athenians here. I mean, they they bring the boy lovers back, boy, the, that line back, and they, again, they're, they're still, you know, stroking the ego of the Spartans in this. So, so really, what, you know, what, what are, are, is this just the B, the B team that we're just, you know, waiting around, hoping for, you know, for the Spartans to, to fix things off-screen. It just, it doesn't make that good of a case for its, its own existence. And ultimately, it doesn't, it doesn't help that this sequel is eight years after the original. And then for it to have so little to, you know, to bring to the table, and for it to be such such a mess. It's just, yeah. And for those wondering, this doesn't really fall up on the end of the, you know, of the first one. It doesn't, you might think that it, it sort of, it starts there. As I've already talked some about, it, it does not. It starts before and then shows what happened at the same time. Midquel, is that the word? Now, the... I suppose that more or less covers it. There are several of the big historical sea battles that are seen here, and they do use some of the same tactics that they used in real life as well. This does not... I talked about how this doesn't fully establish itself. You know, if you haven't watched the first, the comic and this movie do not really provide that much sort of reason to hate the Persians. The first film does introduce a scene, not in the comic, that shows just how, you know, yeah, it shows why the, why the Greeks have to defend themselves against the Persians. And in this one, we actually, I mean, we see Artemisia's fate at the hands of her countrymen, so if anything, we see how vicious Greeks can be even to each other in this. I, I was watching, was it Joe Blow, you know, YouTube, here on YouTube, and there's like, you know, the, the interviewer from there says to, to Ed Green that he actually sympathized with her, he wanted her to win almost, and yeah, kind of, she's, it's completely understandable that she is the way she is, and really, that is the only evil that we really see before, I mean, certainly, we do see some vicious things over the course of the film, but, you know, we don't really get a scene that really establishes this is why the Persians have to be stopped, but we do see, well, this is why Artemisia feels that, you know, I mean, there's, there's that line, and this is not a spoiler, it's also in the trailer, and, and it's literally, it's said in maybe the first 20 minutes of the film. Artemisia swore that she would only she would return to Greece only when she could burn it to the ground, and yeah, I don't really blame her. And in fact, I I think I have some matches around here, so that really, yeah, that that does bother. And that again is is where we get into this kind of messy thing where. I mean, I like that there is this moral gray of, you know, even the Greeks could do awful, and a Greek could be so important in the Persian army and this whole thing, but other than, you know, 
it would just really help if we also saw what the Persians did that made them such a threat to Greece. Now, the... Where the first one very much has kind of the, the golden sunlight, you know, bathing a scene, or the, the blue hue of the moonlight, this one has some more, you know, more variety to that. Again, you know, the first one was a, a painting by, you know, someone who really wanted to idealize what we're looking at. This one is more of just, you know, an HD camera filming everything. You know, like the first, yeah, I believe the first scene has just pouring rain and you have all this stuff that, yeah. It, it really is more, it feels more like the real world. And except, of course, that still, you know, bad guys' bodies and bad guys' ships are made of just, you know, wet paper. It just tears apart like nothing when, when hit by a good guy. Now, the... I suppose that more or less covers it. We do have some nice kind of, you know, some, some weapons that they also used in, in real life in these battles where, you know, they, at one point we see you know, there, there are these fireballs basically tossed to, you know, light ships alight and fire arrows and, and these kinds of things. Now, there are... This is shorter than the first, with only 94 minutes, not counting the credits. It does have an abrupt ending, you know, with, yeah. And there is... I suppose that's more or less it. But, but, yeah, with everything said, it's very enjoyable. It's it's dumb, it's loud, especially like the very beginning is loud. And certainly, I mean, if you don't really think that the first one needed a sequel, then this movie is not going to change your mind about that, and you are quite right. If you haven't watched the first one, but this one looks kind of appealing, you're probably gonna like it. If you if you watch the trailers for this and you're you know, you're enjoying what you're seeing, watch this movie. It does very much deliver what you see in the trailers. This just over the top kind of you know, tons of blood and gore and yeah, this so so yeah. To to close with Quoting Themistocles, seize your glory! Just not in public, they'll arrest you. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.